Before we begin, I think it's very important that we talk about a serious topic, and that is the rise in violent hate crimes against Asian Americans, especially within the last year. I've said it before, but the Asian American community needs more than solidarity. They need action. It's important to note that this violence and oppression of Asian Americans is not a new occurrence by any means. It has been in the fabric of the American way of life ever since the first Chinese immigrants moved to America in the 1850s during the gold rush. I highly recommend you educate yourself on these topics and make sure to amplify and listen to Asian Americans during this time. Dedicate to decentering yourself from the conversation and really dedicate yourself to solutions, education, and action. And I will also be leaving some GoFundMes for the families of the recent Georgia shooting in the description. If you're able to donate, please, please do. And please share those links so we can make sure those families get the help they need. To my Asian American and Pacific Islander subscribers and viewers, I just want to say that I have not always done what I needed to do in terms of educating myself and calling out racist quote-unquote jokes in my community. I am sorry from the bottom of my heart, and that shit's not going to slide ever again. This is a safe space for you, and it always will be. <sighs> Part two, or what I like to call, women apparently can't exist on earth without their interests or appearances being scrutinized, the sequel, Electric Boogaloo. Except the Electric Boogaloo is really race and class structures. So, women apparently can't exist on earth without their interests or appearances being scrutinized, the sequel, Electric Boogaloo, race and class edition. But since that doesn't roll off the tongue, let alone fit in a YouTube title bar, let's just stick to... In my How Hollywood Demonizes Ultra Feminine Characters video, I discussed the brief history surrounding femininity and feminism and how ultra femininity has become synonymous with evil in teenage media, especially around the early 2000s. I'm not saying ultra femininity is always demonized because there are exceptions and pretty privilege does exist. We also dipped briefly into the concept of inlogs, an acronym attributed to the not like other girls trope, and the havoc that it wreaked upon many of our childhood brains. But thinking about the inlogs really got me reminiscing about the no log policy that our sponsor for today stands by, and that is Surfshark. That transition was just so smooth. Surfshark is an award winning virtual private network service that is fast and easy to use, all for a pretty unbeatable price. It provides a strict no-log policy that keeps companies from retaining logs of their users' data. It gives you access to streaming sites and services that would otherwise be out of your reach due to the geographical effects of Pangea. And you can install it on an unlimited number of devices and platforms, including PC, Mac, Android, iOS, and even gaming systems like Xbox and PlayStation. The best part is Surfshark thinks you're special. Most internet users aren't even aware of the amount of surveillance, limitation, and data mining done with their personal information on a daily basis. But Surfshark knows and they won't let that happen to you. Their industry-leading encryption is as uncrackable as the plastic covering over grocery store cakes. I personally have been using Surfshark to watch Parks and Rec, which is available on Canada's Netflix. You can watch your own favorite shows and protect yourself on the internet by using my promo code SHANSPEAR for 83% off and three extra months for free. That's SHANSPEAR in all caps for 83% off and three extra months for free. Thank you Surfshark for partnering with me on this video and supporting this channel. Now, let's get back to it. One thing I failed to do in part one of this series is to define what I mean by ultra femininity. I use the words stereotypical femininity and ultra femininity interchangeably, which may be confusing, so I'll expand on it here. Merriam Webster defines the ultra feminine as, quote, extremely feminine. They go on to define feminine as, quote, characteristic of or appropriate or unique to women. They also define it as, quote, the embodiment or conception of a timeless or idealized feminine nature. The reason I conflate ultra femininity with stereotypical femininity is because I equate ultra femininity with things often associated with the more stereotypical depictions of femininity things like makeup, maintenance, a fashion sense, and etc. But it's also important to understand that, like most things, there is a spectrum of femininity. A person can still be feminine even if they don't embody stereotypical ultra-femininity. I think a great example of this would be Bella Swan. I know, I know, you're probably thinking, but Shania, you added her into the not like other girls trope in part one. You can't say she's feminine now. And to that I say, damn, can a girl change her mind? 
I'm kidding. But I do think Bella can be viewed as a feminine character, just not an ultra-feminine character by my own personal definition. I made the mistake of referring to her as a tomboy character in part one, which was unfair of me because the world shouldn't be separated into two strict categories of gender expression. It's important to not dictate gender expression to the binary, where someone is either feminine or masculine, with no real room to be fluid. A person can be feminine yet still be into stereotypical masculine things and vice versa. They can also be neutral with no concrete expression that adheres to either binary. And in no way, shape, or form do I think it's helpful or moral to demonize people with other gender expressions, like tomboys, while trying to defend ultra-femininity in the same breath. This specifically goes out to all the comments I got in part one that went something along the lines of, quote, society is trying to ruin women by telling them a lie that they can be everything a man can and blah, blah, blah. Women who have tomboy interests are not ruined and people who do not identify with femininity are not ruined. We do not comment or perpetuate that sort of archaic thinking. It's misogynistic and it's gross. A woman does not have to be feminine or ultra feminine to be deserving of respect. Now. Don't make me call your parents and get you grounded, because I will. The way I see Bella fitting into the feminine spectrum is neutral. She's still a feminine character, but she's not as ultra-feminine as, say, Jessica is portrayed to be. And something I think is cool about Bella's character, which not everyone will agree on, is the fact that Stephanie Meyer creates a female character that desperately wants something, and that something is a boy something that is often labeled as trivial or linked to immaturity in the media. And Meyer doesn't present Bella's desire as an inherently bad thing. She's just a teenage girl who wants to date a boy she likes. And that's like the whole plot of four consecutive movies. That's fucking iconic. But let's be clear, I'm not praising Stephanie Meyer beyond that because the whole romance between Bella and Edward is manipulative and overly romanticized despite being unhealthy. I would argue it's even abusive and I would be right. But let's get back to it. That brings us to the Katniss debate. In part one, I said that Katniss falls into the not like other girls trope, not because of her stereotypical masculine interests, but because of how she places herself and Madge, one of the only other girls her age that she gets along with, in opposition of quote, other girls. That was not a well-received take. <laughs> But let me explain. In Catching Fire, Katniss states, quote, other girls our age, I've heard them talking about boys or other girls or clothes. Madge and I aren't gossipy and clothes bore me to tears. She then goes on to explain how instead of those stereotypical girly things, her and Madge go into the woods to shoot. Now, before I go any further, it's also important to note that Katniss does spend time with Madge doing other things, like playing the piano, which could be viewed as a quote unquote feminine pastime. I don't know, it's an instrument. But her and Madge are placed in opposition of other girls their age and placed in a light that makes them different, especially because they only get along with each other. Katniss doesn't explicitly belittle the other girls for their interest, but she does use language that applies a negative connotation to these girly exploits. For instance, the term gossipy, which has historically been used against women in a negative way, with it often being referred to as, quote, trivial, hurtful, and socially and or intellectually unproductive. When we think of gossiping, we don't usually think of a positive occurrence, thanks to years worth of movies depicting women who gossip as dim-witted or mean, and thanks to high school, for me at least. And a lot of commentary even said that her lack of femininity stems from her having to mature faster than her other female peers and that she had to adopt a masculine expression in order to fill the void of her father. I have many issues with that line of thought. Insinuating that because someone grew up fast, they aren't feminine, denounces femininity as an immature gender expression, which was kind of the reason I made the video in the first place. A person that has to mature faster than their peers can still be feminine, and becoming the head of the household doesn't mean someone has to denounce femininity as a waste of time either. I'm not saying Katniss herself denounces femininity as a waste of time, but that's the tone I got from my comment section. I will say though that I can see there being a psychological reasoning for Katniss adopting a more masculine expression to fill the void of her dad, but I don't personally think being strong, taking care of a family, etc. is only relegated to men or masculine presenting people. Katniss is undeniably strong, driven, and an all-around wonderfully written character. I never said she wasn't, and I never will. I'm also not saying she has to be feminine, and I never said she was the devil incarnate for viewing herself as different from other girls her age. Because if we're being honest, there's many things that go into femininity and overall gender expression. Ultra-femininity is viewed in society as high maintenance for a reason. You have to afford the clothes and the makeup and the shoes. And unlike Cinderella, there's no godmothers for that in the real world. No, in the real world, it all comes down to... Marble floors, gold trim, feel like I'm Richie Rich, Italian left, 
French sway. I mix the fist sick, quick loss, take a risk. We play for the They say money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you makeup, clothes, and the entirety of Regina George's life in Mean Girls, which in a materialistic way is close enough. When we look at the numbers, we can't deny the domination exerted by the beauty and personal care industry. After all, it's a multi-billion dollar enterprise, and the only one touching that number with a stick is Jeff Bezos. And the internet tracks that man like he's a cat in a leashed harness for the first time, as they should. The global apparel market, which covers things like clothing and shoes, is expected to rise from its $1.5 trillion value to $2.25 trillion in a span of five years. And the only thing I can think of that could touch that number is well, never mind, it's gone. The point is, money does play a part in how one expresses their identity, whether that be through clothing, makeup, or other material things. It's important to note that people who present themselves as ultra feminine aren't always uber rich with a large economic privilege. For most of my life, I've been considered part of the impoverished class where basic human needs were not met due to lack of financial resources. It doesn't help that I was going through my not like other girls phase through a majority of it, but I do consider myself feminine now. I'm no longer severely impoverished, but I am financially insecure, and yet I still consider myself ultra feminine. But the ultra feminine characters in the media, whether it reflects every instance of real life or not are portrayed as uber rich, sometimes even just upper middle class. Think of Gossip Girl or Mean Girls or even Toni Morrison's novel The Bluest Eye, which I'll circle back to later. Not only is it possible to argue that ultra femininity is demonized in the media, but it's even more possible to link ultra femininity to wealth in the first place and the argument can very well become an analysis of class. Why else would Regina George casually tote around Louis Vuitton, Carla Santini own Tiffany and Dior, and Sharpay Evans be her entire self, I guess, if not because of wealth. Characters of average wealth like Bella Swan wouldn't have the means to be lavish or flashy with her wardrobe. Wealthier characters like Rosalie and Alice, who are more fashion forward, at least for the 2000s idea of fashion, are able to be flashier not only with their wardrobe, but with their cars as well. And further down the line of financial resources, we have Katniss, who is severely impoverished. Storyline-wise, it wouldn't make sense for Katniss to be the Regina Georges or Carla Santinis of the world, because that's who she's fighting against in the form of older, more ancient systems of capitalism. Plus, when you're in survival mode for much of your life, where you have to spend every waking moment worrying about your next meal or your family's next meal, clothes and makeup would be the last thing on your mind. That doesn't mean Katniss is a bad person for not finding an interest in those things, but that's not the only reason Suzanne Collins gives Katniss for not liking those things. She's not a tomboy only because Katniss's dad died and she had to take his position because her mother wasn't capable of doing so. It isn't only because of her financial status, though that is also a very large reason of why. Not only do girly things not reflect her personality, which is all fine and dandy, but they quotably bore her to tears. You know how much you have to be uninterested in something to cry about it? Despite, you know, her rightful adoration of Senna's creations, which, you know, were clothes. I think Suzanne Collins just wanted her cake while eating it too, much like Stephanie Meyer's insistence on Bella being separated from stereotypical feminine ideas, but also wanting to give Bella a big glamorous wedding so they made Alice the overseer. And there's nothing wrong with that. I feel like I have to keep reiterating it. I'm not dragging Bella or Katniss. I'm not even dragging Suzanne Collins, but I am dragging along this section and I'm also dragging Stephanie Meyer. So let's keep it moving. If class is factored into gender expression and wealthy characters are more often associated with glamor and ultra femininity, that also opens the door for other social concepts to be analyzed alongside gender expression. What did Shakespeare say? Two plus two equals four and the history of race in America equals... I had been a have you ever been told that you're pretty for a black girl or have you ever seen depictions of darker skinned black women being perceived in the media as undesirable or aggressive what's that all about <laughs> What? It's because of age-old racial stereotypes that dehumanize and paint black women as monsters, especially when it comes to upholding white women as the pinnacle of feminine beauty? Oh. I knew that already. At quite possibly the worst time on planet Earth, Lana Del Rey came out with a very tumultuous, tiny print, typewritten treachery that she posed as a, quote, question for the culture, end quote. What culture, you might ask? Well, the racist one. But just like anything dealing with race, it set the internet on fire. One half the internet was pushing back against Lana criticism because, oh, she just worded it wrong, but she meant this. And Lana isn't racist, guys. She just pulled ideologies from historically racist rhetoric. Which, funnily enough, both of those statements are true. Do I think Lana meant one thing while writing the other? 
Yes. Do I think she's racist? No. Do I think race be kicking her ass front, left, and right sometimes, even when no one acts and she subsequently played on numerous racial stereotypes to get her point across? Hell yeah! And as interesting as it is to watch, it's also extremely annoying because Lana doesn't explicitly make racist remarks, but she does perpetuate harmful rhetoric that has been used against black and brown women for centuries. Lana herself is a white woman who produces more of an alternative yet soft sound with her music, especially as of late with releases like Norman fucking Rockwell. Lana herself posits that she is delicate and weaker than other women who are quote unquote stronger than she is. That's all fine and dandy, I guess, because Lana Del Rey has been what she calls Calls, slated mercilessly for her public image and the themes she discusses in her music. But the entire first paragraph of her question for the culture is where she goes wrong. She could have posted the entire rest of the think piece because she does happen to make some points. I'm not saying they're necessarily good or bad points, but points nonetheless. But instead, she starts off with the question by including a group of predominantly black women and draws off age-old stereotypes of the strong black woman trope or the sexualized black woman trope to put herself a white woman on a pedestal, something that has been happening for centuries. There is a long history of white women stepping on the back of women of color in order to exalt themselves. Even white female enslavers were instrumental in the oppression of enslaved black people because owning more slaves as a white woman back in the day made you a better prospect for marriage. And trust me, I could do marathons around the whole question of the culture topic, but I would have to make an entirely separate video just to cover all, if not most, of the problematic implications that Lana exhibited. You can find another depiction of race intersecting with femininity in Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. I wrote an entire research paper about this in college, so strap in. I'm going to give you the Spark Notes version to save time. The Bluest Eye follows Pecola Breedlove through the various eyes of different characters like Claudia McTeer, as well as an omniscient narrator who both relay what it's like to be a dark-skinned black girl in the post-depression South. When it comes to race, Pecola falls into one box, black. But not only is she just black, she's dark-skinned and allegedly ugly because of it. Her peers bully her, adults dehumanize her, and her own parents are abusive to her. Then, another line is drawn within the novel and class is introduced as an instrumental part in not only Pecola's treatment, but Claudia's and every other black character's treatment as well. But specific to Pecola and Claudia, class plays another part in their girlhood as a whole and how they present themselves. We become even more privy to this when Maureen Peel is introduced to the story. Maureen is a biracial black girl who has light skin and green eyes. Toni Morrison uses outfits to portray themes of race and class, especially with Maureen's character. Her parents are able to afford new and pretty clothes for her, like stockings and pastel outfits. Claudia, on the other hand, constantly refers to her own stockings, which are itchy and have a habit of falling down, two descriptors that denote her poverty. Maureen, with her proximity to whiteness, is the prettier one, but more importantly, importantly, the more feminine one. All of the characters, whether they're her age or older, fall under a spell with her around. The same boys who degraded Pecola for her dark skin are, quote, reluctant to continue doing so under Maureen's springtime eyes. And this is the reality for many dark-skinned black women. Literally, as I'm writing this script, I got a comment about how I was unattractive and manly. Black women are often excluded from being viewed as feminine, and especially ultra-feminine due to racism and colorism, which of course stem from colonization and Eurocentric beauty standards. Not only does class keep some people from fully embracing femininity through material possessions, but race can also play a role in excluding entire racial groups from the category in the first place. Anyways, I started this script with the idea of analyzing and dissecting the tomboy archetype in mind, but it snowballed into this. I feel it would be a disservice to tomboy and gender-neutral people everywhere for me to just tack it onto this video instead of giving it the spotlight it deserves, you can hopefully expect a video on that sooner rather than later. God, I hope. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching. See you in part three. I love you. Bye. I interrupt your regularly scheduled in screen to bring you a word from our patrons. People who pledge $3 to me get access to behind the scenes content like script, video ideas, extra videos, exclusive polls, and if you pledge $5 a month, you get all of that plus shout outs at the end of every video, as well as personal shout outs on my Instagram stories at the end of every month. My $5 tier patrons include Isabella, Lily, Remista, Ruth, Vazi, Queen of the Game, Rachel, Billy, Kiki, Benjamin, Sloan, and Charlotte. Without these wonderful people, I would be lost. I would be afraid, petrified even. <laughs> so thank you lovely people for your generosity. It definitely doesn't go unnoticed. And to my other patrons, as well as the guys who watch, like, comment, and subscribe, as well as the people who support me on Ko-fi, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I say this with love, y'all are my besties. <laughs> thank you and good night.